This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. For everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level, you came to the right place. I am your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series. And if I had to describe myself in one word, it would be doesn't follow directions. My co-host is John Passon, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki, Sinosplice.com, and doesn't worry about cybersecurity because all of his passwords are protected by amnesia. In this episode, you're going to learn how to level up your Chinese listening skills. John and I will be sharing tips and tricks you can use no matter where you live. Guest interview is with Eric Majerus, a homegrown American boy learning Chinese for the sake of his family. All this and more. Let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Jared Turner coming at you from Utah in the United States. Hey guys, I'm John Pasden. I'm in Shanghai, China. All right, Johnny, we have got quite the episode ahead of us. But before we kick into things, we have a few reviews, and then we have a listener question. Our first review comes directly from Straight Talker One from Great Britain. He says, "Excellent. I'm so glad I stumbled across this podcast. It doesn't set out to teach Mandarin, but instead to motivate." And equip the listener to learn more effectively. The hosts are engaging, funny, and really know their stuff. Hey, hey! Their guest interviews are insightful, interesting, inspiring, and it's great to hear about the different resources and methods available, including the hosts' excellent Mandarin Companion graded readers. I highly recommend this podcast to anyone trying or wanting to learn Chinese. You will not be disappointed. And now we have a、uh, review from Mikvnaktuk in Denmark. Mikvnaktuk. <laughs> Yeah,、uh, it's not just my bad pronunciation. I don't think that's a real name. But anyway, this is a long review, so I'm going to read part of it. You can definitely learn Chinese, and this podcast is great motivation. I started listening to this podcast in June after having started my Mandarin learning journey in January through the YouTube project Challenge Yourself, where my friend and I traveled to China with one goal: find out how much Chinese you can learn through three months of intensive studying. We didn't just do this for the sake of finding out, though. Since we both did an internship in Suzhou last year, we have been discussing how we could possibly get started learning Chinese. And then a chance arose. The three months were quite obviously disrupted, quite a bit due to COVID nineteen, but we made it through by adapting all the time. And ultimately, we ended up in Taiwan and were able to complete our three months, even though it went differently than we could have expected. I was a bit worried that my motivation to keep studying Chinese would drop off after I returned home and resumed university. However, it continued. And I kept studying vocabulary after I came home. However, when I discovered Mandarin Companion through this podcast, I got even more motivated and efficient with my studying by starting to read graded readers and receive comprehensible input. This stuff rocks. The feeling of reading a first book entirely in Chinese is amazing and extremely motivating. I started by、mm -hmm. reading the breakthrough level book Woman Shi Peng Yoma and breezed right through it. Then I moved on to a level one reader and found this to be the perfect level for me. And right now, I've just received the rest of the level one and level two books from Amazon, as I wanted to read them physically rather than as eBooks, which sometimes feels a bit like cheating. I love reading a bit of Chinese every day, and I can feel that it does so much for my level. I hope to go back to China as soon as the world clears up a bit from COVID and have some more one-to-one -one classes while living in a Chinese-speaking environment. But for now, reading graded readers from Mandarin Companion is a great way to keep improving and maintaining my level until I have the chance to visit China again. That's awesome, man. We're really glad that you made it through your three months and you're keeping the Chinese going. Hey, thanks so much. And oh, he does have a YouTube channel. It's called Challenge Yourself. Okay, our last review is from Wing Chung Boys from the United States. He says, "Awesome podcast. Hello, John and Jared. I've been listening to your podcast every day. Hey, that's awesome. I don't think we have that many episodes, but we'll take it. That's how I start my day. I want to thank you for the work you put into creating this entertaining, informative, and insightful show." I sometimes get discouraged learning Chinese, but it's nice to know I'm not the only one facing the struggles. There's no shortcut to learning Chinese, but there are smart methods we can implement. I plan on learning Chinese for the rest of my life. I will not give up, and will continue to keep fighting on. Ciao, yo! All right, Wing Chun boys, Wang Chun, keep at it, man! Fight the good fight. Okay, we are going to address a listener question. Peter, he says. In the recent podcast, you guys are talking about why they don't have English translations in the graded readers. I think it was a, to avoid using it as a crutch. However, I think it could be very useful to have English translations to avoid developing an incorrect understanding and to prevent slowing down reading progress. 
but sometimes it's difficult to find the correct translation of a phrase. Now, Peter goes on to talk about how there's a lot of different translators and they translate a phrase differently. And he cites some specific examples from one of the books, The Secret Garden, about how he didn't quite understand why something was used. But he summarizes it down to this. He says, what are your thoughts on the risks of learning something incorrectly and perpetuating that error into the future? All right, this is an interesting question. It relates very strongly to personality. And let me start off by asking this question. How do you prevent misunderstanding someone when you're just talking to them face to face and they're speaking Chinese and they don't speak English? Yeah, I I think you probably ask follow up questions, right? Maybe clarifying (laughs) questions, right? Okay, you can do that. The short answer, though, is that you can't. You're going to (laughs) misunderstand sometimes in face to face conversations. Maybe it's going to be embarrassing. Maybe it's going to be an absolute failure in communication, but you just got to keep going, right? You got to keep trying. So to the guy's point, I'm sure he's thinking, well, yeah, but that's face-to-face speaking. Reading is a different matter. Reading can be perfect and pure and free of misunderstandings. And that's true. It can be. But I think that's kind of like what your textbook does, right? When you're at a lower level and you're really struggling to parse the most basic sentences, uh, you really appreciate that sentence-by-sentence translation. It's also offered on other sites like ChinesePod or uh, FluentU. They give you that sentence by sentence translation. But at some point, you're going to have to let that go. And you're going to have to risk misunderstanding and just plow ahead and recklessly try to understand with imperfect information. But, you know, I was was mentioning to you, John, that there's times where I, I found out that I have been perpetuating a mistake for years. Like I had misunderstood an exact meaning of something. But one thing I do find out is that if you don't understand something well, you usually don't use it, right? He cited some specific examples in the books where he didn't understand how like uh, high yell was being used when it didn't quite make sense to him. Well, when you're actually speaking, if you don't really understand how to use high all the time, like high yell, that you might just not use it. <laughs> and you'll probably be able to communicate just fine without having to use it. But sometimes listening, yeah, it can create a little bit of confusion, but like, You just got to pull through. That understanding is going to happen when you get enough comprehensible input. And we talk about extensive reading being 98% comprehension. So there is that 2%, which is not full comprehension. And so sometimes a little grammar point or some kind of translation issue falls in there and it's going to bug you, but you just keep going. And if it's a grammar point, you're going to see it again. If it's a vocabulary word, you're also going to see it again. And it's going to bug you and it's going to keep bugging you until either the pieces start falling in place because you see it in enough different contexts to start making sense of it on your own. Or it's going to bug you so much that you're going to like look it up on the Chinese grammar wiki. You're going to ask your Chinese teacher. So it's not going to be this debilitating blow to your understanding of the language that you're afraid it might be. You know, I'd like to just say to Peter also is that, you know, you're reading The Secret Garden, you know, keep reading. Once you get to a few more books, you probably will have an understanding of it. Yeah, and I think this is also this kind of thinking that if you can't understand perfectly, then you can't move forward. I think it's also kind of uh, not giving your, your unconscious mind enough credit. So you're kind of feeling like you have to consciously understand it and to be able to translate it, or you didn't really understand it. But actually, your unconscious mind is going to be working away. It's going to be filing stuff away, moving stuff around, drawing connections, you know, like the conspiracy theory guy running yarn between pins (laughs) on the board. Like, that's what your unconscious (laughs) mind is doing in the background. It's going to be working on it. Absolutely. So just keep at it. Eventually, it just clicks one day and you're like, oh, it just makes sense for whatever reason. It just clicked. And let me just leave you with one other little tidbit here. This is a, a linguistic term. It's tolerance for ambiguity. So tolerance for ambiguity has been researched, and it's a predictor for success in mastering a language. And what tolerance for ambiguity means, you don't fully understand what something means, but you keep going, and you just keep pursuing understanding and communication. So in the the context of a book, it means making your best guess and just going for it. And in the context of a communication face-to-face, it means asking questions, you know, clarifying testing the waters by using a word that they just use and you're not sure if that's what it means and or it just means moving on because you know you're not going to get it that's tolerance for ambiguity you know john side note that's really interesting i didn't know in linguistics they using that term you know i did an mba in management a lot of the theory talk about leadership about good leaders have a high tolerance for ambiguity so hey 
If you can learn Chinese, have a high tolerance for ambiguity, you must be a natural leader, man. Right. Like in the in the business context, it's usually referred to as uncertainty, right? But in language, it's often referred to as ambiguity. All right. So today we're going to be talking about listening, improving your listening ability. I think that's something that some of our users might want, Jared. Oh, absolutely. It's one of the big four. It's one half of communication skills. We have input and output. And then on the input side, we have listening and reading. So like reading, you're going to need a foundation to get started, right? You're not going to want to just start listening to the news in Chinese without having learned anything. You need to learn the sounds of the language, pinyin. You need to learn some vocabulary. You need some basic grammar. Uh, A lot of people do that through courses, textbooks, or whatever. But you're not going to just start cold turkey, jumping in the deep end of the pool and listening to full-on fire hose in the face Chinese, right? Yeah, I, I don't want to. I mean, of course, when I first moved to China, I did. I'm like, uh... Ding boo dong. <laughs> and then like reading, you're not like done learning a word when you can understand once a sentence it's in. I think people sometimes make this mistake when they're convinced that the textbook approach is the full answer. They've studied the chapter on buying something at the store and they know every word. And when they listen to the dialogue, they understand it 100 percent. So therefore, they should be able to go to the store and understand something that's said to them. I don't think anyone totally believes that, but there's kind of this idea that, well, I understood the dialogue. So this is similar to extensive reading, right? You know the words, you know the grammar, but if they're all mixed up in a different context and different sentences, you're not going to get them if you don't have enough input. Absolutely. And that gets back to the comprehensible input aspect, right? Yeah. So what's comprehensible? It's the stuff that you've already studied You kind of know a little bit, but you just need lots more quantity. So just like reading, you need the comprehensible input, and that means you need it at a certain quantity, sometimes referred to as massive comprehensible input. I think this is where a lot of people have a problem. So like maybe they listen to the audio for their textbook and they understand it, but they realize that they're not going to understand all those words in all kinds of new contexts. So then what? How do they move on? Yeah, I think this is a real challenge for listening uh, because in a way, it's a little easier to get graded reading materials than graded listening materials. A lot of the listening that we do do, I mean, we do have recordings, but when you're trying to get into conversation, that person that you're talking to needs to have an understanding of your level if they're going to try to give you comprehensible input and they need to be able to... I guess, speak in a very measured way and use words that you understand so that you obviously can understand. And that can be challenging to do. Having conversations in Chinese with some kind of conversation partner or teacher or tutor or whatever, that is a great form of input. And hopefully that person can speak at a level that you can understand, speak slowly enough for you to understand. But it's not the only way. No, no, not at all. There's a lot of other ways to do it. So this is actually something I worked on for years at Chinese Pod. At Chinese Pod, there are a number of levels, and the the dialogues were created at a certain level. Often, we'd cover a topic that we'd covered before, but we kind of covered in a different way. So if someone has learned this vocabulary, then they can listen to the dialogue, and they should be able to understand it if they're familiar with the words and structures. It's just a matter of like listening more, getting more input. So obviously, Chinese Pod is not the only source. There are other things like Glossica is a, is a method with lots of input. Even some people like Pimsler. I, I know some people feel like it's old and outdated, but Pimsler does repeat and reuse vocabulary so that you hear it again and again. Some people use Pimsler in combination with other things like Chinese Pod, uh, Glossica. There's like Do Chinese has audio. The Chairman's Bao has audio. I know, though, that it is challenging to find audio at your level especially if you're at the intermediate level or above. It can be pretty rough. So what you're pointing out here, John, and and what I'm also kind of picking up is that there are a lot of resources out there, but it could be kind of scattered through lots of different types of platforms. And this is, of course, one of the challenges if you're trying to get a lot of comprehensible listening input, it may take a collection of resources potentially to get that kind of recorded input. Yeah, and I can definitely sympathize with this because I have clients at All Set Learning, this is what they want. And, you know, if it were easy to just go online and find it, then they would have done it already. Some of them have tried. 
it's just not easy to find this stuff. It's all over the internet. And it's not like I'm hiding stuff. It's just really scattered. And it really depends on what you're you're looking for. You know, there's plenty of stuff on YouTube, but you know, YouTube is a scary rabbit's whole mess of its own, right? I mean, there's some good channels. There are some good stuff. But one thing, you know, John, you and I, we've learned is that it is just not easy to create good leveled content. I mean, if it was, then, you know, everyone would be doing it. But it can be a hard thing to do. And also a hard thing not to just create leveled content, but interesting stuff that you actually want to listen to. Right. And and there also is the issue where you go on maybe YouTube or something and you find some content that's kind of interesting. But, you know, everything has pinyin. And so they're kind of spoon feeding it to you. So how do you find the stuff that's at your level, but there's no pinyin? So this is where you might have to get a little bit creative. Like maybe you find YouTube videos and you play them, but you don't look at them. You got to try different stuff. Maybe you, you go on to a Hello Talk and you find someone who's willing to do audio only messages. You just got to get creative and you got to try. Unfortunately, there's not like a single product that you can just buy and it works for everybody, at least not in my experience. But you need the input. You need a variety of input at your level. Don't think that it's just a stairway where you just keep going up and up and up and then fluency is right there at the top. It's not that simple. So, John, you're talking here about some of these uh, pre-recorded, uh, you know, things that you can listen to for listening input. But let's also move on and let's talk a little bit about how can we get this input when we are in a situation of maybe classes, maybe with other learners or having a tutor or with other native speakers. So how can we facilitate like input that's comprehensible to us and get a lot of it? Well, one thing that I've done with some learners is, for example, they've already got lessons with a teacher. Well, record those. Obviously, you need to get your teacher's permission, but why don't you just record everything your teacher's saying? You might even get your teacher to do a summary of what you've talked about today at the end, and your teacher should have a good idea of your level, so the teacher will do his or her best to make it comprehensible, and then you can listen to that. And what's really valuable about that is, one, it should be at your level. Two, it's tailored for you, right? It's what was talked about today, probably. And then three, because you have the audio and you don't have a translation or a transcript, but you should know it, then that makes it good material to go back through. And like, probably no one really likes doing this, but I know it's useful to transcribe the material. And Mm -hmm. probably the teacher said one or two things that you didn't totally get. And so you're going to be stretching at some points, but that kind of stretching can be really good. In fact, I did get an email once, John, from uh, a listener and a reader from Manor Campaign, and she shared with me a links to her Zoom calls with her tutor. And she says that she reviews these lessons, and she goes even listens to her responses that she was speaking in response mm. to her you know, tutor's comments and like trying to understand them and, and realize, oh, wait, I didn't say that right. Yeah, so it can definitely work that way as well. Now, here's something that is going to blow your mind, Jared, but there are audio recordings for our graded readers as well. What? Here's a crazy idea. Crikey. We recommend that you read the book with your own eyes, understand it, maybe even read it again. But after you've read the book, if you've understood it pretty well, you can just go straight to listening without looking at the words. Or if you find that too intimidating, you can listen while you follow along. That's still useful. But at some point, you Mm -hmm. want to get to the level where you've already read the book where you can just listen to it without reading and see if you can understand it. And maybe you even like turn to the page of the book that has the vocabulary list so that when they say one of those hard words, you're like, oh yeah, there it is. Word number 12, right? I remember that. I almost forgot it, but it's right there. So there there are various ways you can kind of make it a little bit easier on yourself, but you're working on your listening by not following along with your eyes. And that can be super useful. So the, another tip that you can do to try to get more like listening input is how you're utilizing time with like a tutor. So if you are studying independently or if you're in a class, but you have your own tutor, one great thing that you can do is don't take that tutor time to like study. All right. So if you're actually doing explicit study, like you're studying a textbook or a curriculum or whatever it is, do that on your own. And then when you go to your lessons with your tutor, Turn that into a discussion about what you studied. And what that does, that gives you opportunity to maximize that time for listening and obviously output, so speaking. 
about what you've learned. And this is something we've talked about before on the show is about doing this also with like graded readers. And it can be very effective. And John, I think you can touch on this, but maybe you read a chapter or two, and then you go to that tutor session to talk about those chapters that you read. And there's discussion questions in the backs of our books. A lot of the other graded readers have those too. And that's a great opportunity to have a discussion about something that's at your level. And your tutor usually has an understanding of what your level is too, and they can kind of speak to that. Yeah. So this is often referred to as the flipped classroom approach, right? You do your studying on your own, and then you go to the lesson ready to talk and ask questions that your teacher can address. So just to make this a little bit more clear, what you don't do is show up at the lesson, open the book, and the teacher's like, read this passage, and then you read it, and they're like, what does that mean? And you're like, I don't know. And then they're like, oh, well, do you know this word? Do you know that word? Okay. So don't do that. Look up those words in advance. That's not to say that reading a little bit during a lesson isn't useful, but if you find you're spending a big chunk of the lesson just reading something out loud, that's probably not improving your speaking or your listening a whole lot. So instead, read it on your own. One thing that some people do, like I have a friend, Rob, who's doing this right now with Man and Companion Books. He reads in advance, sometimes two or three times, like one or two chapters, and the teacher does not have a copy of the book. He was originally thinking that the teacher had to have a copy of the book or the lessons weren't going to work. But I was like, Rob, do you know how easy this is for a Chinese person? Like they can read a chapter in like 30 seconds. So I was like, don't worry about it. Just read the chapters that you're going to study with your teacher. Read the discussion questions. Make sure you understand everything. Give the teacher a minute to read it. And then you just launch into discussion right there. So true. So true. And there's a couple other ones I think are worthy to mention. Uh, One is finding like a language partner. So we call this a language exchange. In this case, we want to find a Chinese person who is learning English. And of course, you're learning Chinese. And so this gives you an opportunity to have some sort of conversation. And there's a lot of ways to facilitate these, John. You probably have a lot of tips on how to do that. Well, I find with language exchanges, one of the biggest challenges that you introduce yourselves, what your job is and where you're from. And then it's kind of like silent. (laughs) Like there may not be a lot to talk about. You can definitely facilitate this if you bring along something like maybe it's a Mandarin Companion book or maybe it's something else that you've been working on. Just because it's in Chinese doesn't mean it can't also be discussed in English. One thing though in a language exchange is that you need to make sure that you get your Chinese time in as well. It's not uncommon that their English is going to be better than your Chinese. So you might be tempted to speak more English than you would Chinese. But you have to make sure you also stay disciplined and you say, stay a little bit focused. Hey, I want to speak Chinese. And so I want to make sure I'm getting my Chinese time in there. (laughs) Yeah, actually, I've talked to uh, Chinese friends who are working on improving their English. And they're like, English Chinese exchanges don't go so well because I try so hard to speak lots of English, but then they don't seem to like it. It's like, well, are you helping them with their Chinese? I find that if both sides are like altruistically really trying to help the other person learn the language then they will both like try hard to keep the balance there. You know, one other tip I'd like to cover is just also just trying to have random conversation with people. Now, this can be a little bit of a hit and miss. I do recall, John, you had mentioned at one time someone you had talked to that they would just go to coffee shops and just uh, go to random people and say, hey, can I buy you a coffee? Like Chinese people and sit with them and just speak Chinese, right? Yeah, yeah. It seems kind of insane, but it works. <laughs> I will say that there's something that we have coming out here, like new merchandise available. One of our shirts that we have, it says, you know, Shu Zhongan. So it's going to say, speak Chinese with me. You can wear shirts like that walking around. I guarantee, you, unless you're living in some very small rural village, there is going to be someone around that speaks Chinese. Or either, like John, where I'm living, like in one of the town next to us, there's like 5,000 people, but there's like two Chinese restaurants. And I went there and they're Chinese people. You know, it's so you, there's Chinese people everywhere, even in rural America, and you can get out there and you can try to find ways to speak Chinese with people. Not everyone knows like exactly how to speak to a learner, but you can try. And also the more they speak, the better practice they get in speaking to someone who might be struggling with Chinese. I, I will give a good example is that when we lived in China, John, our first Ai, our kind of nanny maid, she was excellent. Like Heather, my wife, her Chinese, she was just learning, but she knew how to use the right words and say things in the right way so that she could understand. And so you will find people like that out there. And those people are gold. 
you want to talk to those people. <laughs> they can understand how to speak to someone who is learning Chinese and does not have a high level. So get out there. There's a lot of ways to improve your listening, but the bottom line, if you're going to improve your listening, someone else needs to be speaking. And so whether that's a pre-recorded speaking, <laughs> if it's someone reading something that's a level of text or having a conversation with someone who understands how to speak to a learner, those are all going to be excellent ways to get comprehensible input for listening. Yeah. And just get creative guys. Like everyone has a recorder on their phone now. It's amazing how seldom some people use it. If you're playing audio, remember you can adjust the speed on lots of different kinds of stuff. And if you do go out and try to talk to strangers, or if you wear your 跟我说中文 t-shirt, and I know that takes some courage, but if you're going to do that, do your homework. Don't just be like, I'm going to talk to random Chinese people. And then like, as soon as you find one, just say the first thing that comes into your head. Like, no, actually come up with a line that isn't creepy and it's friendly <laughs> and uh, it might result <laughs> in people wanting to talk to you. And in the same way, if you're wearing a shirt that says, Go show Joe what do you think they're going to say to you? So you have to kind of rehearse this potential conversation. That's something we can maybe talk about in the future once we get lots of our listeners wearing these shirts and giving us more feedback on that. <laughs> That's right. So uh, anyway, get out there, guys. You can do this. You can understand Chinese with the right input. All right. Now it's time for a word from our sponsor. And today our sponsor is... All Set Learning. So All Set Learning is my consultancy, which helps you learn Chinese in a personalized way. And today I wanted to highlight something that relates precisely to what we were talking about earlier, which is we have book club courses, one-on-one -on -one online lessons with a live teacher discussing Mandarin companion books. So if you have a local language partner, great, but a lot of people don't. So if you finish reading a book and you understand everything, that's awesome, but you're probably still struggling to say much about the book. So even if you've already read the book, it can be great to reread it, prep each chapter, look at the discussion questions, and then just jump in there and talk to someone and have a discussion about it. You'll find that it's quite challenging, even though you know all the words and you understand every sentence. Yeah, so I've heard a lot of great things about this book club, and we've had a lot of great reviews. I know you from people who've taken it there for, through Allset. So you can find it where, John? So allsetlearning.com. Click on the courses link. All right, so get it today. All right. All right, now we got rants and raves. John, what do you have for us today? Do you have a rant or do you have a rave? Okay, I have a rave today, but it's kind of a sad rave because... It's in keeping with today's theme about working on listening. And uh, there used to be a site called Slow Chinese, slow-chinese.com. Yeah. yeah, it went down. It went down like, uh, I, th I think, last year. Oh. It just kind of disappeared. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, like they were being super generous, putting kind of somewhat graded readings. They're kind of like intermediate level, like exactly the kind of stuff which there's not enough of. They were putting these readings online, the transcript, and then they had audio recordings of each one. But um, really a really cool project coming out of Beijing by, I think, a Chinese person. And it just kind of disappeared. I think you can maybe find some links to some old content. I don't know. I hope someone gets their hands on all that material and finds a way to make it available. Because, you know, it used to be free and now it's just gone. And if any of you have like a tip for Slow Chinese, where to get it or how to get in contact with the person who is running it or whatever, feel free to get in touch and we can help facilitate that possibly. All right. So, Jared, what do you got for us today? All right, Johnny, I've got a rave. I guess I'm kind of raving about me. Sounds a little... <laughs> Sounds entirely in character. Go ahead. <laughs> it's, just, it's like show and tell, I guess. How about this? So just about a week and a half ago from the date of this podcast, uh, I did a webinar for Chinese teachers on how to use graded readers to build student fluency. So this was about an hour and a half. So we spent a lot of time putting this together. I had some help from some other teachers pulling together all like the theory behind extensive reading, but specifically how it's done in the classroom, complete with specific activities to do in the classroom with students. So if any of you guys are like in a college program, high school program, or any classes or whatever they be, this might be helpful to your teacher, especially if you want to try to get them into the classroom. What I've experienced in talking to hundreds of teachers over the last five, six years, really, 
is that a lot of teachers, like they want to do graded readers, they want to use them, uh, but they don't know how. And I didn't fully understand this, John, but it was about a, just over a year ago, I did a pilot extensive reading course with a Chinese dual immersion class here in my town for the seventh grade dual immersion class. And, you know, I came in knowing all the theory, but it wasn't until I got in the classroom and I was actually trying to do this with students. I'm like, this is hard. Surprise. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> and, and literally, it, I think it took me about five, six weeks to really figure it out. But once we figured it out, man, it was awesome. And then all of a sudden, everything I've been reading with other teachers, everything kind of clicked. So I'm actually writing a teacher's guide for extensive reading in Chinese. But this webinar, it's now available on YouTube. Oh, P.S. We have a YouTube channel. You know, we, I think we have like what, 30 subscribers now. But anyway, we'll put the link in the show notes. So if anyone, uh, you think this could be helpful uh, to your teacher, please share it. We had about 180 teachers participating in that uh, webinar. And there's a whole bunch of materials you can download. The presentations available for download through the links. We have worksheets and activity sheets. So please share this with your teacher administrator, or anyone who is interested in extensive reading and is involved in Chinese education. Yeah. And if your teacher is already involved with or familiar with extensive reading and would like to add something, contribute, share knowledge and experience, we would love to uh, communicate with uh, Chinese teachers. We haven't had a Chinese teacher on this show in a while. It's mostly about learners who have made it, but there's definitely a very important place for native speaker Chinese teachers, right? So we do appreciate your help. Well, I appreciate your help, John. Thanks so much for your help with that webinar. <laughs> no problem, buddy. Oh, oh, by the way, speaking of my help with that webinar, I'm the one that created the uh, 95%, 98%, 80% comprehension in Chinese. Y yeah, okay. All right. You made one you contribution. You even stuck my face <laughs> in the PowerPoint, so I was part of it. I, I'd say against your will, but you didn't even know about it. So, yeah, we did it. Well, I know now, don't I? Thanks to YouTube. My name is Eric Majeris. I am from Minnesota, USA. I am still living in Minnesota, USA. I've been here my whole life. Part of that's, you know, why I'm interested in foreign languages, because I've been here forever. Eric is in our special WeChat group for the podcast. If you want to join it, send me an email at feedback at mandarincompanion.com. I'm a programmer, a web developer, and so I really like the computer side of life, but then I also like the human side of language as well. Eric has at times a comical story of learning Chinese and is a good example that even if you are surrounded by Chinese speaking people, you still have to put forth the effort to learn. However, when you put forth that effort, life often becomes richer. Stay with us. Okay, Eric, so I always lead out with this big question, okay? Uh, you know, we, we've gotten to know each other a little bit, you know, on WeChat and through Manor Companion and the podcast. So uh, tell us, why did you start learning Chinese? Well, originally I started learning Chinese just because I knew a Chinese person, right? Was this a girl? Yeah, you see your first ah. girlfriend, right? <laughs> Here we go. And, and you're like, oh, yeah, this is cool. I'm going to learn some Chinese, right? You know, things don't work out and then you just forget about it, right? And I've always dreamt about being bilingual. Um, a lot of people just take it for granted. They, they just grow up in a bilingual family. Right. And, but for yeah. someone like me, that's like, that's like a dream. Right. Well, I want to back up a little bit. So first off though, there was, there was a girl you were interested in. So I mean, was she like a classmate or something or what was it? I participated in the English language meetup. Um, oh, okay. just, just real casual, you know, helping just daily conversation with, uh, anyone that attended. Um, and so there just happened to be a girl, uh, in there that I sort of got to know. You start just learning some phrases in Chinese or what? Uh, pretty much. I just kind of bug them constantly about questions, you know, um, how do you say this? How do you say that? And then, um, you know, I sort of get into pronunciation. I was always fascinated how these Chinese names, you know, sound so exotic, um, and I was always like, I don't want to use your English name. I want to use your Chinese name, right? Um, but of course, I was just awful at it. I just, you know, butchered <laughs> it, you know, at every opportunity. <laughs> as as we all are, especially at the beginning, right? Yeah. 
I mean, did you keep the interest? Did you continue to learn and study? Or what happened later where you, you said, hey, I'm going to really learn? I think that uh, helped seed my interest in language further. You know, like I said, I did the German thing, but it didn't, you know, pan out. But well, wait, uh, talk about that German experience a little bit. What was that? And like, what, what spurred that on? I mean, how old were you? What was the Sure, situation? sure. I was uh, in college, like early 20s. I was sort of at the attitude, you know, 21 years in the same state in the U.S. is like, so yeah, I just enrolled in a language school over there and took a semester off from college just to learn German. I, I didn't really know any when I went over mm -hmm. there. What was that experience like? Oh, it was super great. I mean, it's not really so foreign because it's I'm um, being a Westerner, but it was a great experience because, you know, I had language school, so I had daily interaction with German, kind of just getting out there, seeing all the the signage. I, I really love seeing signs in foreign language. Well, then let's fast forward then. So, okay, German, but I mean, you days, I guess you didn't really stick with it. I mean, it... yeah, I mean, I kind of did. I, I tried to, even when I was with my now wife, but... I, it just came to this realization that if you don't have anyone to talk to in the language you're learning, it's just so hard to go anywhere. It's it's kind of demotivating, you know? So I pretty much just stopped. I didn't learn Chinese again until I got married, pretty much. You met your now wife, it's Chinese, but you didn't really pick up Chinese then till you started, till you got married? You know, I didn't want to like put all this effort into learning Chinese for the wrong reason. So I didn't, I purposely didn't learn Chinese while we were dating. And we dated, you know, for five years or something. But after then, I was like, oh, well, I got to talk to her parents. And we're going to have kids in the future. And I got to talk to her parents about my kids. Because what I haven't said yet is those five years, I actually lived with them. Or they lived oh. with us. We lived together. Her parents? Her parents. So. Oh, okay. And they're they're here in Minnesota. They're in Minnesota, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I spent five years in the same household, not speaking to her parents. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess they don't really speak English. Is that accurate? No. Yeah, they don't speak English. You know, they work at uh, Chinese restaurants here, and communications in Chinese, and business. You know, they find Chinese business people here, and family will help them out for things that you know, they can't find translation for, but so yeah, they, they only wow. speak Chinese. They speak Thai Chinese. Oh, okay. I, I assume they also speak Putonghua, right? They do to a degree. Yeah. Oh, okay. right. So they're, they're speaking, so you said Thai Shan, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thai Shan. Oh man. So it gets a little messy. Um, so I knew a few phrases in Thai Chinese, you know, which is like a dialect of Cantonese. You know, after we got married, like, okay, I want to be serious. I should learn Cantonese, maybe. It's close enough, right? They speak fluent Cantonese. And then like a month into it, my wife's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, God, I'm going to learn Cantonese. And she's like, no, no, no. I want to speak Mandarin to our daughter. And I thought, well, hey, that's even better. So I <laughs> toss Cantonese out the door and I start learning Mandarin. I would even, it might be interesting just to mention a little bit, uh, you know, for some of the listeners, they may not know some of the differences between Mandarin and Cantonese. I mean, one of the ones I know, the big one is that the, what there's seven tones as yeah, opposed to yeah. four. What else did you find was that maybe a big difference or was more difficult? Well, I mean, there's like the tone thing and they're, they seem that they're more similar tones. You know, they're not as pronounced as in Mandarin, but you know, the whole language sounds different. You know, it's a lot more into the vowels um, and into the extension of the sound where, you know, Mandarin's a little more cut and dry which is something I actually appreciate. And now I got to ask, though, that your wife, I assume she learned Putonghua or just standard Mandarin in school, right? She she did. She calls Mandarin a foreign language. So she grows up speaking Thai Chinese regionally. She learns Cantonese through like Hong Kong TV and whatnot. And then she learns her, quote, foreign language in school. <laughs> and so, yeah, that was just an interesting perspective uh, that she had that I never really would have thought of. That sounds super interesting because I, I had a, an assistant once uh, for one of my businesses back in China, and she was from a small village in Chengdu. And she said she didn't even learn Mandarin, Putonghua, until she went to college. Wow. She's actually very intelligent. I, I was very impressed with this girl, but she would tell me stories how they had to walk like an hour a day to, to school. And so 
school they said was no fun but you know the walking with friends and through the mountain fields and stuff was was always a fun experience going to and fro every day and I'm like that's some crazy stories and and she is what she's probably like 32 now and so i mean you know this was like she's happening 15 years ago 20 years ago this was happening and uh, she didn't learn chinese till she went to college unreal yeah yeah it's, it's crazy and you know they didn't speak mandarin where you know she was growing up they just spoke thai chinese there and it's not like it's a small city it's i actually don't know the population it's it wasn't even on google maps until a couple of years ago i mean you could just zoom in indefinitely and see the the road structure but there's there's <laughs> wow. no name right but now it's actually kind of changing like just the last time i was there my father-in-law was complaining that people weren't speaking thai chinese it's just the social dynamic is changing. So he had to use Mandarin to someone at the train station um, instead of Thai Chinese. And so it's, yeah, it's really strange, you know, to see just how quickly things can change. I'm also curious, like there in Minnesota, do they have like a, a like, a, I guess, a community or people from Thai Shan from that area and they all speak Thai Chinese with each other? There's a smallish community, mostly in the restaurant business. There, there seems to be a handful of Thai Chinese restaurant owners. And I guess historically, Thai Chinese used to be very popular in like the Chicago area. Um, oh. So that's kind of how, you know, they get here. Then when you decided to, hey, I, I'm, I'm, we're getting married, you know, I, yeah. I want to be able to <laughs> communicate with my in-laws. Cantonese, no. My wife said, no, hey, I want to learn yeah. Mandarin. So what did you do to start learning the language? The first thing I did was just kind of see what is out there for classes or something. So I found a Confucius Institute class, you mm -hmm. know, sort of my intro, right? And it was relatively cheap to try it out. And I just told my wife, I was like, well, I'm just getting my feet wet, you know, just just to see if I can do this Chinese thing long term, right? Um, so I did that for, you know, about six months. Didn't make much progress, really, to be honest. It was... Well, where did you feel like you started to really make progress? Kind of what, what happened? What surrounded that? Well, I, I quit Confucius Institute classes. <laughs> <laughs> you quit <laughs> <That's>, classes. <laughs> yeah. Now I make um, progress. <laughs> and, and honestly, at that point, I wasn't sure if I was going to, like, you know, continue. But a friend that I had in that class um, asked if I wanted to join him with a private teacher. Mm -hmm. um so he's like hey i found this this teacher you know they teach at a university here and we can go to her house and just get one-on-one -on -one lessons and and so i was like you know you know i'm in you know so it was it was a weekly thing and we went to her sat in her dining room table and she asked us kind of what we wanted to do and we ended up getting a textbook integrated chinese at what point did you feel like you started to really like hey make some progress mostly like dinner table talk sitting at the dinner table with my father-in-law so my wife would work evenings and so he'd cook something delicious and then you know he'd tell me to come eat and then we'd sit there together and if we didn't talk it's just silence um so it's just kind of awkward you just sit there you know you know eating whatever you're eating and just dead silence right um but he's super talkative mm -hmm. so i'd always always open up something lame like you know so how's the weather and he'd always jump into it and so that was kind of like a real fun moment that sort of told me like hey you know this is kind of worth it like i'm doing an awful job but i'm able to talk to him about the weather you know i ask him about the food dishes what was in it you know and then he'd run to the kitchen and pull out all the ingredients and show them to me <laughs> And it was kind of comical because he's got a very thick Cantonese accent. So his pronunciation is something I have to like really try hard at, you know, because he's not a native Mandarin speaker either. And he mm -hmm. didn't learn it in school. Right. And so mm -hmm. it's sort of this hilarious battle of conversation. But <laughs> we, we have a good time. How did this impact your relationship with your in-laws? Oh, it's definitely good because they just felt like roommates, you know, for, for five years, right? It's, oh, it's just the people that I live with. But, you know, when you're actually able to talk to someone, you can sort of see their ideas um, that they have. And even at a basic level, get to know them sort of as a person, right? So now we have a, a common tool that we can use together to sort of learn about each other. And so that's really helpful. 
you have a unique situation here of like, you know, you lived with your in-laws and to a point where you couldn't communicate and to a point where now you're able to communicate. And I just, I, you know, I, I see, I've interviewed so many people and I see that value of connection. You know, you've been able to bridge cultures, bridge, you know, interpersonal boundaries uh, that language can facilitate. And so I imagine your story, there's probably have to be a, a number of rich experiences there. Yeah, it's it's true. It, it usually comes through just kind of funny interactions. Uh, just recently, my, my father-in-law wanted to put up some shelves in the garage. And so he, he wants to tell me like he's going to buy a saw and he wants to put them here and he wants to take this wood from out outside that I had just kind of thrown into the, the backyard. You know, a lot of the time it's, he's sitting there in the garage with me talking, you know, fairly loudly cause he's a loud guy and <laughs> I'm just kind of staring at him, just kind of nodding my head like, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then I usually just end up kind of repeating what he said, just, just to make sure we're on the same page. Like, oh, okay. So you want to buy some wood, you want to, you want to hang it up there. Right. And then we do that like five times. Cause it was a constant repeating back, making sure, all right, we're on the same page. We're on the same. Are we really on? Okay. I think we're, let's check one more time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, I want to put a shelf up here. Okay. You want to put a shelf there? Yes. I want to put a shelf up there. It'd be great. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. You want to put a shelf up there? <laughs> yeah. Uh, how is your Chinese progressing? You know, and, and what opportunities do you, I mean, you have your in-laws, but I'm curious, do you speak with your uh, wife in Chinese and, and how, what do you do now to keep your Chinese progressing forward? I try to read. So I'm, I'm really into the graded readers. Um, Hey, I know a great series for those, you know. Yeah, I have a few. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I, that's something I try to keep up on for my own, my own personal gain. I find that if I stop reading, then I start to forget things unbelievably fast. Um, mm. And so I go pick up reading again. It's like, oh, I, I knew all those. Um, so that's sort of like key for me is to read because it's something I can kind of do in bed and uh, do it in my relaxing time. I try to speak with my wife in Mandarin in scenarios where I know what I'm talking about, sort of. It's really hard to speak a foreign language with someone who's expecting you to be more competent than you are, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, cut me some slack. <laughs> yeah, and like, you know, I've been saying what I want, you know, and she's like, I just, I just don't get it. And so usually it's, I'm missing context, right? And so... I may be saying the few things that I know, you know, what I want, but she's missing sort of the context of why I'm saying that. So she's like, there's a billion things that could sound like that in Chinese, you know. You know, I talk to people, you know, about learning Chinese all the time. And it's great to hear that, you know, for you reading, you know, reading is one of those like passive things that you can do. And uh, and I, I got to say for me, even I've been in the States now for about two and a half years since I moved back from Shanghai. And like, I will, I read books in Chinese. And there are some times where I felt like even when I've been here in the States, it's progressed in certain areas better than if I had just been just normally speaking with people in Shanghai. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's a fantastic way to just you know, keep up Chinese. So I guess anyone listening, I mean, in fact, I think most people listening to this podcast, we know most, not everyone has that opportunity to go to China and learn and practice and live among the people. And that's fantastic if we can. But it's just not practical for everyone. And so you've had the opportunity to go to China a few times, right? You said you've been to Taishan? Or... Yeah, yeah. I've been to China twice. The first time we went to China is when we got married. And so at that point, I didn't really know much of anything, right? I dabbled a little bit. And so I really relied on my wife when I was there to translate everything. I remember one time I went to buy a shirt and I go to the lady she asked me if I need help and I tell her like, Oh, I don't, I don't speak Cantonese. So she switches to Mandarin and says, Oh, can you speak a Mandarin? And I was like, Oh, I don't speak Mandarin either. And she just like <laughs> shrugged and was like, sorry. <laughs> and walked away. Well, what would that be like now? Well now, so like the second time I went to China, I basically I had the same encounter and I told them, Oh, I'm interested in buying these shirts you know, how do I do that? And this was actually a custom t-shirt shop in sort of the, the underground malls of Guangzhou. I was on the lookout the whole time I'm in China for a shirt with like Chinese on it or something that mm -hmm. doesn't say like 
something silly, you know, like mm-hmm. the name of city or something. Um, <laughs> Has Chinglish on it, right? Uh, yeah, right. And so I get to this underground t-shirt shop and they walk in, they see me and they're like, oh, you know, a couple, couple foreigners, right? So they, everyone hurries up over there. There's like three employees or something, you know, and they ask me like, well, look, and she points at the wall and she says, Spider-Man. You know, and I was like, no, 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 it's okay. I don't use it. And she looks at the other wall and she's like, Iron Man, right? And so they're pointing out these Marvel comics. And <laughs> I'm sure they're fully licensed as well, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, and I was like, no, 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 I want a shirt with Chinese on it. And so she started to show me those and it opened up a conversation where I was able to tell her, yeah, I'm in China with my wife and and this is in Chinese, right? Yeah, this is then in Chinese. So I'm saying, you know, I'm out on my own, taking my brother-in-law to the airport. And so I started striking up a conversation with these business people. And it turned out to be really fun, right? Because they were just fascinated that I spoke any amount of Chinese at all. And I was fascinated that they wanted to take the time to listen to me ramble, you know, and stumble, <laughs> right? And so... It was, it was kind of a blast. It, so I ended up buying like six shirts from them. Um, yeah, <laughs> Fully they, licensed shirts, right? Fully <laughs> fully licensed shirts, yeah. And they, they'd point to one with Chinese, and I'd have no idea what it says, right? And I'd send a picture to my wife, and it's like, does this say like I'm a stupid foreigner or something? You know, cause they're in that crazy fonts, you know, that you can't see. Yeah. Um, and she's like, no, that's a funny shirt. Okay, so then, then I get that one. And so, yeah, it was a super... Super fun experience to be able to talk uh, the second time versus the first time where they just shrug, you know. That's really rewarding, you know, to see, like, what can you do with your language after working on the language and studying? Well, uh, Eric, if you could go back and, you know, and and do it all over again, like, what would you do differently? Yeah, I, th- I thought about that for a while, and... I don't, I don't know exactly what I'd do differently, but... What I know I would seek out more would be more reading opportunities. You know, we already kind of touched on the importance of reading. The, the second moment I had where I thought like, wow, I can do this was when I finished my first book. And so I've got that book now. I was like, I'll never get this book away, right? This is my first book. Which book was it? Uh, that one was Monkey's Paw. Oh, yeah, it's a hojwa. <laughs> hojwa, yeah. That was, that was a really rewarding moment for myself. Knowing that, you know, now there's breakthrough books um, and knowing that this is such a rich uh, medium for learning. Um, if I did it again, I'd find something like that to supplement sort of the, the beginner learning, right? Because you're in that textbook, you're getting beaten down, you know, every chapter, right? And you're just like, when is it going to let up? Why, when can I read more than a few sentences? And so I think it would have been really inspiring to have more, more opportunities like that to, to read. Well, Eric, I, that is really insightful. Words from a man who knows. <laughs> thanks. Well, Eric, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us on this podcast and share your story and experience with us. It's been insightful to me and I hope to many others. Oh, thanks for having me on. It was a great time. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, birthday boy, hiker, gelato eater, bat girl, cougar hunter, newlyweds, back to schooler, weirdo, and that one gal named Elizabeth. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at mannercompanion.com. If you feel like you've got an interesting story to tell about learning Chinese, reach out to us. If we're desperate enough, we just might get you on the podcast. Apologies to John Cena, we just ran out of time. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself, Jared Turner, and our editor is James Harbour. I'd like to thank our guest, Eric Majerus, and of course, thanks to my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Paston. See you next time.